I've been asked to talk about um, water implications of foreign direct investment in agricultural land in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I wasn't at the earlier consultation, so uh, I'm not aware of, I'm not clear of how much was discussed at that, but I understand that uh, the FDI in, in agricultural land was a uh, point of discussion at the last one. Um, I've been asked to give a, 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 an overview of issues, and uh, so I'm going to be fairly brief, but uh, uh, there will be points that uh, perhaps will need further explanation later on. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to just say is that I think that, that often the land grab, as it's presented, is portrayed as being uh, neo-colonialism, neo imperialism, and so forth. Um, I think it's important to recognize that there are converging, converging objectives. Um, there are certainly a set of objectives that's driving foreign investment, and um, these are, I think, probably fairly well known to people who read newspapers. Um, the problem of uh, food, increasing food prices, unstable markets, and um, as a result, on the one hand, commercial investment, uh, by companies seeking simply to generate uh, agricultural production profit from higher prices, but also state investment. And we're talking about the uh, Chinese and Saudi governments, for example, as, as examples, seeking cheaper and more secure food. Now, I think there are issues here in the virtual water discussion. Um, this effectively seems to me is, is therefore a question of market failure. Um, that the markets are not delivering, the food markets are not delivering secure food supplies. And I think this is uh, an issue here. Whether, indeed, better regulation of food markets would actually take some of the speculative, uh, some of the security concerns out of this kind of investment. So that's one, one element which I want to just raise. The other side is one has to recognize that these investments are the result of active soliciting on the part of African governments. Um, there are these well-known resources, um, uh, well-known figures, uh, that Africa's, Africa's water resources are underdeveloped. Uh, water is managed, as it's called, shorthand, for, or, or irrigated is, is a shorthand for that. On only 5% of cultivated land, water withdrawal uh, is less than 3% of total renewable resources. Um, in other words, Africa's water is underdeveloped, underused, um, in other words, cheap. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that African governments have a history of seeking investment, seeking capital investment for uh, developing agriculture. This has been going on for many decades. And I think what has happened now is that you have, in a sense, willing buyers as well as willing sellers. In the past, there wasn't a lot of interest in agricultural investment while agricultural commodity prices were falling. That's been the change. But I think one has to recognize that the African governments themselves are extremely active players in this, um, rather than seeing them as passive victims. Um, the second set of points I want to make really are, are to, to, to hammer home the, the point that there are no land deals which do not have water implications. Now, I've identified three separate types of, of land deals which one might come across. Um, in semi-arid areas, um, for example, the uh, Malibia investments on the Office de Niger in Mali, uh, which is a, a, an irrigation scheme in um, a semi-arid climate, it's quite clear that any investment will involve irrigation. In fact, much of the investment is to build and extend new irrigation. So that's quite explicit. But I think that there's also, uh, in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa, which would be classified as sub-humid, often with rainfall of 1,000 meters plus per year, um, you will often find these areas classified in agroecological terms as having sufficient water for total rainfall, sorry, for, for uh, rain-fed agriculture. In other words, these, these will be typically uh, areas of um, rain-fed agriculture, in other words, using green water. However, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the, the rainfall is often unreliable. In other words, 
This is subject to uh, extreme variability at the start and the end of the rainy season. It's often uh, subject to extended dry periods during the rainy season. Um, in other words, despite the fact that you have in average annual rainfall terms what should be sufficient water, the distribution of water through the, through the rainy season is not uh, such as to guarantee productivity. Um, and uh, I think you can see that as a consequence, any proposals for commercial investment imply um, uh, water use. Either because crops have very high water requirements, and I've indicated there sugarcane and rice, which are by definition going to be irrigated. Um, or they are dry season crops, which therefore need to be irrigated because there's no rain at that time of the year, which would be the case of wheat, vegetables and fruit. Or they may be crops requiring supplementary irrigation. And I put jatropha there because uh, although much of the hype around jatropha as a, a producer of biodiesel potentially is supposed to uh, involve its use of marginal land and poor rainfall and so forth, if you actually look at the yield levels proposed for projects, these yield levels can only be achieved under very, very good optimal growing conditions, which will mean good water availability. So I think we have to recognize that even where the, the proposals imply, uh, uh, say that this is rain-fed farming, I think it's fairly clear that some kind of water management will be required. I just put at the end there, enhanced rain-fed farming. <coughs> um, there is a lot of interest at the moment uh, in trying to overcome water constraints even within uh, fairly traditional forms of rain-fed farming. In other words, it's recognized that um, for even for small-scale farmers, let alone for large-scale commercial farmers, some kind of water management will be required if you're going to improve productivity. So my point here is that where you get a move to commercial agriculture, you will always get a move to increased water use. Okay. Moving on swiftly, the, the third point I really want to make here is how do we estimate impacts? And what I'm trying to, I've used some examples here from the Lower Limpopo, this is work done by uh, Van der Zag and his colleagues actually in, in uh, Mozambique uh, using the Lower Limpopo. I'll just run through these figures fairly quickly if I may, if that's okay. Um, this is existing use in terms of water. This is a million cubic meters per year, okay, so an average figure. Um, <coughs> this is registered use, that is formal irrigation, but there's also, in the same stretch of the river, unregistered or informal irrigation. You can see that the amounts of water being used on an annual basis at the moment are, are comparable. They're not that far different. There, there is a proposal, or at least the environmental concerns are that there should be this amount, 240 million cubic meters, should be allowed to go into the sea for environmental purposes. Okay, this gives you a total existing use of around 423 million cubic meters per year. If you look at the projected commercial investment that the government is planning through inviting foreign direct investment, this is estimated to figure about this amount. I'll come on to, I'll elaborate on that in a minute. Either way, it's about uh, four times the existing use. However, if you look at the and this is available figure, of course, is open to, to dispute, as I should point out, you have an average annual flow, average annual flow, of more than double that. So on this basis, if you take average annual, and if you, t you, you could say, no problem, whatever the government proposes here, is got, there's plenty of water for everybody. So that's an estimate of uh, impact. However, if instead of uh, you using average annual flows, you look at the probability of water uh, according to historical records, you come up with a slightly different uh, assessment. This is the existing irrigation in terms of area, hectares. That's what's actually currently irrigated, around 14,000 hectares. 
the projected increase that we that I alluded to just now would take us up to about 73,000. That's those are projects that the government has, in a sense, uh, identified or is hoping that someone will fund. If you take account of annual flow variation, then you can, then you can say, essentially, 80% of the time, that is, four years in five, you will have enough water to irrigate. 52,000 hectares. In other words, rather less than what's projected here. If you take part of this area, part of this 52,000 hectares, and you allocate it 100% assurance, in other words, you give it priority, as, ha as was the pro uh, that was a real live project, uh, sugarcane ethanol project that was proposed, now cancelled, but had that been guaranteed 100% assurance for 30,000 hectares, it would have, mean, it would have meant that the remaining 22,000 hectares would have had only sufficient water three years in every five. Okay? So what might look sufficient water in average annual terms looks very different when you start building in the probability of lack of water, which is based on natural variation of rainfall. Okay, so I just want to finish now with some final points. Um, first of all, land investments invariably involve water resource development. Relevant indicators of impact are needed, and by relevant I mean seasonal and probability. That means what is the impact on the low flow? I mean, there are, there are cases, for example, that the Molybia Investments in the Office de Niger, which is one of the few for which contract details have appeared uh, in, in the public domain, specifically says that that project will have priority of water use during the dry season. Now that has a, a, a clearly a, a disproportionate effect, not only on uh, the use of water as a whole, but also on the potential impacts of all other water users, because you're actually prioritizing, much as I've pointed out in that 100% allocation, you're prioritizing one particular user, which will, exp which will definitely reduce the availability of water disproportionately to others. So talking in estimating impacts in terms of average rainfall, average river flow, that kind of thing, will give you no idea of the impacts. So I think we really need, the second point I'm trying to make here is, what are the indicators we're using to assess impact? I do not think that the indicators in use at the moment are anywhere near adequate. Um, existing water use, this is a, a point I haven't really uh, brought out in, uh, in what I've said already. Existing water use, which is often seasonal, in other words, people tend to use uh, irrigation during the dry season, they may not necessarily use so much irrigation during the wet season. Um, it will often be informal, it will probably be unregistered, uh, it may be protected under law, case in Mozambique, all those informal irrigators in law have priority. In other words, no one can take their water. The trouble is, because their water use is not registered, nobody knows. So it's all very well having legal protection, but unless you have visible water use and recognise water use, then there's a big there's a big risk that it will simply uh, be forgotten and and uh, they will lose those those losses will not be uh, factored into any agreements. The fourth point is really a reflection on this, which is private water investment. I think, and, and I think private water investment will largely involve increasing storage like dams of one kind or another. Um, and some of these dams can be very large in local terms. If you have no water storage infrastructure, you have a large project, and I've seen recently a large project producing bananas, um, 3,000 hectares of bananas involved building a dam of 60 million cubic meters capacity. This was one of the largest dams in the country that was built by the private sector for its own private use. The question is, that is potentially of enormous public use. 
this could create security of a sort, in the sense you have created a new storage facility where there is none. So the question is, what public usage rights are going to be specified for such infrastructure? Okay, I'll leave that. Okay.